very much, Ray. Um, Jennifer Burns is an assistant professor of history at the University of Virginia and has been since the year 2007. Before that, she was a lecturer at UC Berkeley from 2005 to 2007. Not mentioned on her CV is the fact that for two years she was researcher at the Harvard Business School. She somehow forgot to mention that in her academics. I don't blame you. <laughs> uh, she received her bachelor's degree at Harvard in history in 1998. I assume she snuck across to Charles after that to do two years at the Harvard Business School, which my guess is that Ray probably had some role in arrangement. She received her master's uh, in history at UC Berkeley in uh, 2001, and she received her PhD uh, in history at UC Berkeley in 2005, where she wrote a prize-winning dissertation that eventually became goddess of the market Ayn Rand in the American right, which is a uh, widely reviewed, and I think generally well-reviewed, uh, book and a book uh, from which she will actually make some money, I suspect, unlike most <laughs> books by, uh, published by Oxford, including my own. Um, <laughs> um, and that's an outcome that Ms. Rand would have been, I think, uh, very approving of, although I'm not sure she would have approved of all that Professor Burns has written about her. I enjoyed the book very much, and I heartily uh, endorse it. It's fitting that the Columbia Business School is uh, hosting uh, Professor Burns this evening, um, as evidenced by the substantial turnout tonight. Uh, Ayn Rand has many followers at Columbia <coughs> Business School, and many of my students over the 40 years that I've been a member of this faculty uh, have been devotees of Ayn Rand, um, which is not surprising because so many of my students, and I suspect some of my colleagues, think of themselves as supermen and superwomen. <laughs> um, uh, I, I thought I would spend just a minute, I hope I don't take too much time, but um, I, it, uh, the book reminded me of some things that I'd forgotten about. Um, one of which uh, is that one of uh, Ms. Rand's um, uh, sort of, I guess, real acolytes was a faculty member at the Columbia Business School for a period of time, and that would be um, Bob Hessen. When I joined the faculty in 1970, I was assigned the task of teaching a core course called Conceptual Foundations of Business. That's what it was called in the catalog. The students called it Confounds and that was the uh, title it lived and eventually died by. Um, uh, Bob Hessen uh, was hired by Ms. Rand in 1959 as her secretary. I'm not sure how long he stayed in that role, but within the next decade, he received a doctorate in economics at Columbia University, and in the late 1960s, uh, he joined the Columbia <coughs> Business School faculty, and like me, a couple years later, was assigned the horrific task of teaching confounds uh, to Columbia <laughs> Business School students. I remember him well as a very nice man who I argued with a lot. Um, uh, and after one argument, he urged me uh, to read Atlas Shrugged as a way of straightening out my views. <laughs> and I agreed with him on the condition that he would read Das Kapital as a means of straightening out his views, and I certainly got the better end of that. Uh, <laughs> um, shortly after that, I'm not sure that it was cause and effect, Bob left CBS uh, for the greener pastures of the Hoover Institute, where he remains, I believe, a very active scholar. Um, I haven't been in touch with him for years. Let me say one thing about uh, Professor uh, Burns' book. Um, in my political economy course, I pay a lot of attention to uh, events in the lives of the grandmasters of modern political economy, events that may have influenced the way they think about 
the world around them. And I thought the beginning of this book was absolutely great. And if you'll just bear with me for a moment, I'd like to read the first paragraph of the book. Well, you will you're stealing part of my show, go right ahead. Oh, I wouldn't want to steal. <laughs> Okay, I'll read the first paragraph. It's a great first paragraph. <laughs> it really is. You know, you can tell a lot about books by their first paragraph. This is a great first paragraph. It was a wintry day in 1918 when the Red Guard pounded on the door of Zenobi Rosenbaum's chemistry shop. The guards bore a seal of the state of Russia, which they nailed upon the door, signaling that it had been seized in the name of the people. Zenobi could at least be thankful the mad whirl of revolution had taken only his property, not his life. But his oldest daughter, Elisa, Ayn Rand, 12 at the time, burned with indignation. The shop with her father was her father's. He had worked for it, studied long hours at university, dispensed valued advice and medicines to his customers. Now, in an instant, it was gone. Taken to benefit nameless, faceless peasants, strangers who could offer her father nothing in return. The soldier has come in boots, carrying guns, making clear that resistance would mean death. Yet they had spoken the language of fairness and equality, their goal to build a better society for all. Watching, listening, absorbing, Alyssa knew one thing for certain. Those who invoked such lofty ideals were not to be trusted. Talk about helping others was only a thin cover for force and power. It was a lesson she would never forget. It's a great paragraph. Um, I'm really happy you could be with us. I enjoyed the book immensely, and the stage is yours. question that comes up a lot when I talk about Ayn Rand, which is, how do you pronounce the subject of my book? How do you pronounce her name? And I learned over the course of my research, the historically accurate pronunciation of her first name is in fact Ayn. And the trick I tell people is that in keeping with her philosophy, the correct pronunciation of her name rhymes with the word mine. So that's my trick to, uh, to help you remember how to say it. So you may have noticed there's been a lot of talk about RAND lately, and most of it dates from the financial crisis of last fall. And so uh, what I want to do today is um, talk about the two most common reactions to Ayn RAND in the wake of this crisis. And I took the title of my talk from what I see as the two most common reactions. So is she a scapegoat, the reason everything went wrong, or is she a prophet who predicted what was going to happen? And there's sort of two cycles of uh, reaction to the crisis in terms of how it reflected on Rand. The first wave came um, when it was assumed by many liberals and many on the left that the financial crisis had definitively proven Ayn Rand and her philosophy wrong. It had been tested, it had been tried, and it was wrong. Um, an attitude perhaps best summarized by an article written by Jacob Weisberg in Slate titled, The End of Libertarianism. It's over, it's done with, it's been proven wrong. So that was sort of in the first shock of things are falling apart, why? Uh, wait a few months, government reaction unfolds, various mm -hmm. solutions are proposed and implemented, and we get a whole nother wave of discussion Ayn Rand saw this coming. Ayn Rand is being proved right. She's a prophet. She saw what was going to happen, and what has happened is a product of the mixed economy. The solutions we've come up with to this problem are dangerous and wrong, and Rand's work showed not only that this would happen, but that things are only going to get worse unless we have a quick course correction and go back to the fundamentals. So these are the kind of two big um, polarities out here. And um, what I want to do is kind of dig into some of the issues in this talk, paying particular attention to the Randian roots of Alan Greenspan, because I know this is a topic that people are always very interested in. And I think that we're all still trying to figure out 
what happened in the financial crisis, what triggered it. And it would be uh, very presumptuous of me to say I have an answer to propose. Um, but what I would argue is that any conversation about capitalism in the United States needs to include Rand and needs to recognize the force and power of her ideas. So in my book, I situate Rand as part of a larger movement that arose during the course of the 20th century, an intellectual and political movement that pushed back not only against socialism, not only against communism, but against liberal reform as embodied in the New Deal. And so uh, this, this movement pushed back against reform efforts and proposed capitalism and markets as the solution to a whole range of economic and social ills. Now, Historians have been slow to include Rand in this movement, to uh, understand her as part of this. And I think there's a couple reasons why. One is that she's often considered just a cheesy novelist um, who appeals mainly to the pimply adolescent in the throes of an identity crisis. Um, my first response to that is, gee, it's really important who teenagers are reading. That's a pretty important time of life when you're figuring out what you think and where you stand. So I don't think it's uh, denigrating her intellectual influence at all to point out she has a lot of teen readers. In fact, I think the opposite. But um, what I really argue in my book is instead of thinking about her as a sort of fad of youth, we should consider her the ultimate gateway drug to life on the right. And uh, <laughs> so what I mean by this, or, or what, what I focus on to sort of elaborate this theme is two facets of her thought. The first is her defense of limited, minimal government, and the second is her promotion of unregulated laissez-faire capitalism. Now, Rand also twinned these uh, foci with it, unrelenting, unremitting atheism. She's very outspoken about her secularism. And it's for this reason that I don't call her a conservative, and that I chose the title of my book very carefully. Ayn Rand and the American Right. And I wanted, with uh, this term and concept of the American Right, to draw our attention beyond uh, the mainstream conservative movement, beyond the religious right, and to bring uh, to the fore a whole range of um, secular thinking on the right, secular libertarianism, classical liberalism, um, anarcho-capitalism, plain old capitalism, a, whole, a broader ideological field that includes but is not limited to modern conservatism, which takes religion as having a key role in, uh, in its self-identity. So what I do in my book is I describe Rand's life, her ideas, <coughs> why people were so drawn to her, and what sort of effect she had upon them. Now, I'm the only author who's been given access to Rand's personal papers, which are closely held at the Ayn Rand archive. And I use my access to these papers to uh, flesh out the hidden dimensions of her thought, the connections she had, the ways her ideas developed and changed over time. And it also really helped me flesh out her impact, um, who she met, who she knew, and who was reading her, and what reading her meant. And what I discovered in the archive is there's sort of a feverishness and intensity to readers' encounters with Rand, which some of you may have experienced yourself. Um, I quote here from a letter I include in my book, which was sent to her by a young fan, who writes, quote, about a month ago, I noticed how much I was talking about your books to my friends and classmates. As a result of my enthusiasm, I have lost two friends. <laughs> <laughs> I am beginning to realize how unimportant these people are. <laughs> now, readers like this might move away from her. They might move away from this intense engagement. But what remains are her ideas about capitalism, about markets, about politics. This is why I call her the gateway. She brings people into a new world they didn't even know existed and she leaves behind a very firm stamp on their minds, even as they may become religious conservatives, even as they may decide uh, the Chicago school is where it's at, even as they may leave Rand behind, bits of her stay with them as they move forward. And as I show in the book, she's at this point become a, a really fundamental part of American politics, American culture, how we understand, understand ourselves, markets, capitalism, and, and uh, the morality of capitalism as well. <laughs> so 
let me back up a little bit and, and give you sort of a snapshot. Who is Ayn Rand? She was born in Petrograd, Russia in 1905 as Elisa Rosenbaum, the eldest daughter of an affluent Jewish family. When she was 12 years old, her family lived through the Russian Revolution. Now this is the part in my talk where I typically read the first paragraph <laughs> of my book. My uh, but no, it's fine, save, save me some time. So just take yourself back to Professor Horton reading that first paragraph. Remember sort of what happened. So that's how I opened my book, situating Rand in her historical moment, which was living through communism and drawing some very fundamental lessons about morality, about capitalism, about government from what she witnessed, this confiscation of her father's property. Now, after that moment, her family uh, lost its, its comfortable position in Russian society, uh, tumbled to a life of poverty. They were barely eking out a living, trying to get by in revolutionary Russia. And by the time she was in her 20s, Rand had had enough. She knew she had to get out of there. Sorry, Elisa had had enough. Knew she had to get out of there. And she convinced her parents to write to distant relatives in Chicago to ask if they would sponsor her for a visit to the United States. The pretext was she would go to the United States and study the emerging film industry, return to Russia, and help Russia launch its film industry. Um, everybody involved knew she had no such intention of coming back. She was going to go, and she was going to stay. So um, she is successful in getting permission to leave, goes to uh, New York and Chicago. And I'll, I'll sort of fast forward here, because I describe in detail the, what, what she goes through in her early years in the country. Um, but she, uh, uh, and it's really an extraordinary tale. I mean, Rand called herself or thought of herself as a child of destiny, and in many ways she was. She got on a train from Chicago to Hollywood on her first day there, met the famous director Cecil B. DeMille, talked DeMille into giving her a job, um, <laughs> met a dashing young actor, Frank O'Connor, whom she soon married, now ensuring she was a US citizen who could stay in the country. And um, she began uh, writing throughout this period. She was, her first idea was to make it in the movie, so writing screenplays, short stories. <coughs> she began experimenting with plays and novels. But it really wasn't until the publication of her second novel, The Fountainhead, in 1943, that she became an icon of the right. And this was the book that drew to her a politically aware and politically active readership and following. So, what I discuss in my book is how The Fountainhead is more than a story about an independent, intransigent architect who uh, won't take no for an answer or won't compromise his designs or his artistic vision for anybody. Yes, it's, it's that story on one level. But it's also a parable about the dangers of expanded government and collectivism and a reaction to Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. Now, as I detail in the book, when Rand began writing the book, she had an idea, she had a sort of artistic idea. And over the course of, the of time as she was writing this book, primarily in New York, during the 1930s, when communism was a, a strong influence on the literary culture of New York, she experienced a sort of political awakening. And by the time of the 1940 presidential campaign, she set aside work on her manuscript and became a volunteer for Wendell Wilkie's 1940 <coughs> campaign. Um, and it was this moment that really uh, made her realize she could be a political writer and a political thinker as well as a novelist and an artist. Um, and so as I write in the book, the Wilkie campaign really transformed her sense of self. It, it was a watershed moment. And I want to read you here um, an excerpt where I describe um, what happened to her in the wake of the campaign or some of her work. Rand was deeply disappointed by the disappearance of the Wilkie clubs, but intrigued by the idea of the independent clubs, a proposed successor organization. These clubs would be nonpartisan local organizations that would encourage good citizenship and political part participation. Rand began to imagine a new organization along these lines, but national in scope and primarily educational in nature. It would become a headquarters for anyone who wanted to continue fighting the New Deal. Eventually, the group would grow large enough to support a national office and a periodical. This new organization would build on and preserve the spirit of the campaign, which, at least in New York, had drawn together a group of serious intellectuals committed to a meaningful defense of capitalism. It was the kind of community Rand had always hoped to find someday, 
and she was loath to let it disappear. Now what's interesting here is this organization never came to pass, but you can see in that the sort of seed of Rand's mature career when she would have her own newsletter. She would have an educational organization promoting her philosophy. Um, and so some of uh, where she later went, I think, was sort of brewing in her mind as she entered this first period of political activism. Now, she shopped around um, to look to find sort of partners to bring them into this, um, into this crusade. And she had stopped working on the novel and was writing political pieces. And so I'm going to read here a brief description of one of the earliest political pieces she did. Um, this is an unpublished piece of writing that I saw in the archive. And so this is something that's not available, but it really helped me see that Rand was thinking of herself as really a political writer, a political thinker. At this point, her novel was on ice. She wasn't even the novel that would become the fountainhead, or was you know, gathering dust on her shelves. So Rand went around, um, found some collaborators, and one of them suggested, why don't you write up something that says who we are as a group and, and what, our, um, you know, what, what our goals are. The result was Rand's 32-page manifesto of individualism, the first full statement of her political and philosophical beliefs. Pollock wanted something much shorter, but once she got going, Rand couldn't stop. She spent an entire weekend pounding out an essay that would, quote, present the whole groundwork of our party line and be a basic document, such as the Communist Manifesto was on the other side. In contrast to her novel, the manifesto had practically written itself. Rand's version of the Communist Manifesto were the hallmarks of her later work. It was an all-encompassing vision that included a statement of rights, a theory of history and of social classes, and keen attention to human psychology. It was a first pass through many of the ideas she would later flesh out in both her fiction and her nonfiction. There were some critical differences, both in content and in tone. Rand was more expository and more nuanced in this first statement than she would be in her published work. Most significantly, she did not include reason as an important part of individualism, and she used the word altruism only twice but many other features of her mature thought were there. And so I provide a sort of fuller um, analysis of this uh, document in the book, but I, I will leave it at there for now. And just say, these, these, this piece really highlights how Rand thought of the Fountainhead as a political work, how she hoped it could, as she said in a letter to a friend, even make an impact on the next election. You know, She had very broad visions for what she could accomplish through literature. And she self-consciously was imitating the literature of the left, um, the, the, the uh, uh, communist-inspired efforts to create a literature of the people. She wanted to do the opposite um, for her side, as she called it. Now, businessmen became, uh, after the publication of The Fountainhead, Rand's most enduring and faithful base of readers. Um, Small businessmen opposed to the New Deal loved the Fountainhead, and they sort of seized upon Rand as a, a figurehead for their movement. Um, and she met a whole host of uh, business libertarians in California who were organizing some of the first libertarian groups in the post-war world, and I trace out those relationships in some detail. But if businessmen were Rand's first and most enduring fan base, uh, close behind that were students. She always had a strong appeal to young people, as I've alluded to. And by the mid-1950s, so a good decade or so after she achieved her first fame, she had gathered to herself a close circle of students who were eager to learn the fundamentals of the philosophy she was then developing. Now, this group of students clustered around her went by the semi-ironic name of The Collective. Um, and, you know, the collective was one of many libertarian salons in 1950s New York. When you put it in context, it's not all that unusual. The Austrian econo economist Ludwig von Mises had a salon. The uh, other Austrian economist, Murray Rothbard, had a salon. Rand had a salon. It's the best remembered uh, today because of its most famous member, Alan Greenspan and he was part of this small um, inner circle around Rand. So I'm gonna read an excerpt here that describes the beginning of their relationship and some of what um, impressed him about Rand. Although Rand disliked him at first, Alan Greenspan soon became one of her favorites. 
At early meetings, he was quiet and somber, earning the nickname The Undertaker from Rand. <laughs> Heavily influenced by logical positivism, Greenspan was unwilling to accept any absolutes. He became legendary for his confession that he might not actually exist. It couldn't be proved. <laughs> Hearing this, Rand pounced. And by the way, who is making that statement? <laughs> to Greenspan, it was a deep exchange that shook his relativistic beliefs to the core. By many accounts, Rand excelled at the kind of verbal combat that impressed Greenspan. Hiram Hayden, an editor at Bob's Merrill and later Random House, marveled at Rand's ability to conquer sophisticated New Yorkers in any argument. Quote, many are the people who laughed at my description of her dialectical invincibility, only later to try their hands and join me among the corpses on the Randian <laughs> battlefield. <laughs> Rand began with the basics, establishing agreement on primary axioms and principles. She came out on top by showing how her opponents' ideas and beliefs contradicted those foundations. This approach was particularly effective on those who prided themselves on logic and consistency, as did Greenspan. He remembered that, quote, talking to Rand was like starting a game of chess thinking I was good, and suddenly finding myself in checkmate. Greenspan was hooked. So um, what Rand taught Greenspan and the other members of the collective were the fundamentals of the philosophy she was developing, the philosophy of objectivism. So this is a, a com complicated um, system that I can only sketch out briefly here. So I'm just going to point out four facets of objectivism. Um, Objectivism holds that there is a knowable, objective, external reality, hence its name. It argues that reason is an absolute, man's only guide to thought and action. It holds selfishness to be a virtue. And it argues that laissez-faire capitalism is the most moral and practical social system. Now, Rand articulated these ideas in Atlas Shrugged, which, like the fountainhead, can be read on multiple layers. It's the one hand an adventure story, a mystery story um, that has the productive members of society vanishing in a mysterious strike, um, the leitmotif, the who is John Galt question recurring through the novel. But it also has this philosophical system deeply embedded within it. And like all authors, Rand had high hopes for her book. It was her opus, her masterpiece, um, hopes which were destined to be truly smashed by a round of almost unanimously negative reviews that greeted the book. As Time Magazine asked, quote, is it a novel? Is it a nightmare? And it just got worse from there. The book <coughs> was panned left, right, and center. To read the book critics, it was uh, the worst and most unpopular book published in all of 1957. Now, as it turned out, book critics were not the only ones out there reading Atlas Shrugged. And though it was terribly panned, it became an immediate bestseller. And it really won to Rand her most loyal uh, following. And it launched her on a career as not just a novelist, not just a writer, but really the leader of this philosophical and intellectual and political movement that called itself objectivism. Now, Rand's first moment of popularity on the right, as I described, came during the New Deal. Her second real moment in the sun came during the Great Society. And it was during the 60s that objectivism really reached fever pitch and emerged as an independent ideological position on the right. Now, uh, uh, Rand was a supporter of Goldwater, but it was really after Goldwater's campaign failed and Lyndon Johnson came into office and initiated the liberal programs under the name of the Great Society um, that her popularity really took off. It also took off in the context of the draft, because Rand, unlike most conservatives, criticized the war in Vietnam and criticized the draft, which again made her very popular among her young following. And during, this, uh, during the 60s, Rand's ideas were promoted primarily by the Nathaniel Brandon Institute, an educational institution headquartered here in New York, but it had, uh, you could uh, sign up via tape transcription to hear these lectures um, given by Nathaniel Brandon, who was her closest student and secretly her lover as well. There's a whole uh, plot involving that um, that I play out in the book. But uh, uh, with the Nathaniel Brandon Institute, with the publication of Rand's newsletter, which reached a peak of 20,000 subscribers, 
a steady stream of nonfiction that she published throughout the 60s, all of which followed the pattern of Atlas Shrugged. Terrible reviews, incredible sales. Um, all of these together really created objectivism as its own world, its own subculture. She was the first person to do an end run around the mainstream media and just say, I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to set up my own little world, uh, the critics be damned. So it's the objectivist stance on capitalism I want to highlight here. Um, I said before that objectivism holds capitalism to be the most moral and practical social system. So let me address um, this question. Why is capitalism the most moral and practical social system from the objectivist point of view? Well, the practical is pretty easy to dispose of. It works better. And this is something a lot of people were saying at the time, a conclusion that many people were reaching mid-20th century. Why is it the most moral? Here's where we really see Rand's own contribution. Um, as part of objectivism, as part of her work on the Fountainhead, Rand mounted a full frontal attack on altruism, which was her word for Judeo-Christian values. And she really was uh, working in the tradition of her first philosophical favorite, Friedrich Nietzsche, and proposing a transvaluation of values, where all that is good is held to be bad, all that is bad is held to be good, easiest seen in this assertion that selfishness, typically considered a vice, is in fact a virtue. So, uh, so Rand was really sort of uh, inverting traditional ethics to create the argument that capitalism itself was moral. And she attacked the idea of altruism specifically, uh, which she uh, defined as the altruism she defined as self-sacrifice, or sacrificing yourself for other people. In its place, she proposed selfishness. Um, each person pursuing their own interests and values for their own benefit. Now, this might sound familiar. It might sound a bit like Adam Smith and the invisible hand and self-interest, this sort of staple of economic thinking. Um, it's not quite like that. It's much more thorough because Rand extended this morality of selfishness to ev every realm in life, not just economics, not just an idea about how we do transactions in the market, but something that should affect all areas of life. And she also did not counterbalance this idea of selfishness with any other set of virtues. Um, whereas Smith, for example, talks about sympathy, which is the sort of corresponding balancing virtue um, uh, to self-interest. Rand was not very interested in balance. She was interested in consistency and purity. So this principle of selfishness, once articulated in one realm, had to extend to all others, had to be comprehensive and all-encompassing. So I, I want to look at how this idea plays out in her political philosophy. And Rand's core political principle was that the initiation of force is immoral. No man may initiate the use of force against another. Again, an idea that, that you, you can see in a, a host of thinkers in the Western political tradition. But it, again, it plays out in interesting ways in objectivism, because according to objectivism, applying this principle Taxation itself is immoral, because what lies at the base of taxation is force. So there's a gun at the base of taxation, therefore taxation is immoral. And the role of the state, according to objectivism, is limited to three things. Enforcement of contract, uh, maintenance of a police force, and national defense. And so taxation is not a legitimate um, activity of government, compulsory taxation. Rand hypothesized that um, something akin to a stamp tax could be used. So if you decided to take advantage of the judicial system of the United States, you would pay a tax to do so, and that would be how the government would be funded. But she also kind of pushed that aside and said, we're really far from that, we're not close, and, and other people will work out those details. So that was a place where she proposed the principle and, and felt other people should come along and think up the application. And in fact, Rand framed capitalism itself as the unknown ideal. We had never known true capitalism. She argued it had never been tried. What we have is not capitalism, but a mixed economy, a combination of capitalism and government controls. Uh, now, this is where we see the nub of the idea that Rand is a prophet or that Rand's ideas um, help explain what happened with the financial crisis. Rand called big business America's persecuted minorities. 
and any collusion, any regulatory capture, any uh, unethical relationship between business and government was for her always the fault of government was always the fault of government for having created a structure of power that business then abused. Now we can see a modern version of this in the idea that through the creation of entities like uh, Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, uh, the government created entities that had illicit power, or inappropriate power that were then taken advantage of by unscrupulous people. You can even see a version of this argument in uh, our good friend Bernie Madoff, right? What caused Bernie Madoff? The problem was the SEC lulled consumers into a false sense of security. They didn't have to do their homework themselves because they let the government do their homework themselves. They abandoned the, the principal caveat emptor. So uh, these are the roots of the argument that RAND is not a scapegoat or a cause of the financial crisis, but moreover that the crisis was the fault of the government, not the fault of capitalism. And in fact, Rand's followers go on to say, um, Atlas Shrugged predicted all this. Atlas Shrugged shows that the economy will crumble if government gets too big. Um, it predicts how government bureaucrats would stifle innovation and would take over. And we really see the Randian argument coming out in response to the solutions, not so much to the collapse, but to the solutions. This where it has really developed because in Rand's novels, Atlas Shrugged in particular, her readers are seeing parallels to what's happening today. So in Atlas Shrugged, Rand predicts an aristocracy of pull, she calls it. An aristocracy of pull where what's important is who you know in Washington, not how you perform in the market. That's what makes you succeed or fail, who you know, your connections. And she says, when this is what starts happening, we're in real trouble, our country is doomed. When it's the government who picks the winners and the losers, um, uh, you might as well head for Gulf to Gulch. It's all over. Now, the contrary argument, of course, is that Rand's attack upon government is part of a general movement to weaken regulatory structures. And it's the weakening of these regulatory structures that we can point to for some of the uh, crises we've seen uh, recently. And now this line of thinking traces a direct line, often from Rand to Greenspan and says Greenspan should be faulted for discouraging regulation, for failing to understand the housing market was dangerously inflated. And it's been given its, its most solid piece of evidence by Greenspan's breathtaking testimony before Congress in which he said uh, he had discovered, quote, a flaw in my model and suggested that the ideology he had followed for 40 some years was wrong. There was something wrong with it. He didn't know what it was. Um, but he was going to, uh, he was admitting that he was, he was partially wrong. Now, I think since then, Greenspan has backpedaled as fast as he can, and I, in fact, queried him while writing the book about this very issue. He wouldn't agree to an in-person interview, but he did answer my questions over email. And he asserted in this email message that the flaw of which he spoke was technical and had nothing to do with Ayn Rand. <laughs> Now, I revisited his testimony recently on this issue, and I find it hard to square uh, this ex post facto explanation with what he said. And it really struck me how Randian his statements to Congress were. So he said, um, quote, an ideology is, is a conceptual framework with the way people deal with reality. Everyone has one. You have to. To exist, you need an ideology. The question is whether it is accurate or not. Now, this is almost identical to the same idea that Rand would say, is everybody has a philosophy. Who needs philosophy? Everyone needs philosophy. You have a philosophy, whether you know it or not, so you might as well try to figure out what it is, try to make it strong, and make it explicit. So a very, very interesting echo. Um, and, and having found that echo, I thought it would be fun to go back and revisit some of Greenspan's essays that he published in one of Rand's nonfiction books, um, capitalism, the unknown ideal, in 1967. Um, now, I, I found, um, uh, and, and as I was looking at these, um, I kept in mind, I think it actually was Bob Hessen, who said this to me, your old colleague, um, whom I met in California, and he sort of poo-pooed the idea that 
Greenspan could have written anything and said Rand wrote those and he just stuck his name on it. So um, that may be so. That may be so. Um, it is interesting that in at least one of these articles, Greenspan cites his academic work, so papers before the American Statistical Association. So, uh, so uh, I, I don't know for sure. I uncovered no smoking gun that indicated Rand wrote these and then Greenspan signed his name. Um, they appeared under his name. They came out in 1967, just as he was entering um, Republican politics through his work for the Nixon campaign. So this was kind of the transitional moment where he moved out of the objectivist ghetto, as it were, into Republicanism. And he had three uh, essays here. I'm just going to briefly limit them. I can elaborate more um, if you're interested. And um, as I said, I was surprised coming back to them how Randian they were, I mean, how orthodox objectivist they were. So the first essay that Greenspan contributed was called Antitrust, and was attack upon the antitrust laws, especially the Sherman Act, which he labeled, quote, utter nonsense. And the essential argument was that antitrust laws are, uh, are wrong, and also in, uh, they're wrong because they uh, coercive monopolies are the fault of the government, they're not the fault of business. So the economic logic underpinning them is simply wrong. And they're morally wrong because they punish the successful for being successful. <coughs> now you also see here shades of Austrian economics, the theories of Ludwig von Mises, who was a particular favorite of Rand, whom she made, turned on a lot of people to Mises. And Mises really lays out this argument that you can't have a monopoly without a government, that it's government that creates these artificial <coughs> barriers to entry or maintains monopolies. And Greenspan sort of uh, discusses this and says um, that you could have a monopoly because someone is so efficient and so good, nobody can get into the market. But if you have a monopoly based on high prices, that won't last very long because high prices will attract entrance, essentially. And so um, you know, the government has no business fixing problems that it's creating. But then it ends with this um, sort of classic uh, peroration, this, this Randian idea that um, it ends on this statement that uh, antitrust is a, quote, condemnation of the productive and efficient members of our society because they are productive and efficient. And here again is a sort of glimmer of the Nietzschean idea of ressentiment or resentment or that um, the weak try to pull down the strong because they envy their accomplishments. So this is the, this is the take on antitrust. Um, he also offered a short article, Gold and Economic Freedom, um, which argues that the gold standard and only the gold standard is com compatible with economic freedom. And really, uh, the, the, there's, there's a variety of reasons why, but one of the main arguments he proposes is that, um, quote, the gold standard is incompatible with chronic deficit spending, the hallmark of the welfare state. Stripped of its academic jargon, the welfare state is nothing more than a mechanism by which governments confiscate the wealth of the productive members of society to support a wide variety of welfare schemes. So again, this idea uh, of the objectivist political philosophy that uh, government um, confisc is a confiscation, that taxes are confiscatory, and um, that spending on welfare programs is fundamentally a, 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 a mechanism of confiscation or redistribution. And Greenspan has given sort of mixed indications that he still sort of supports a gold standard, thinks it would be a good idea, and then sometimes alleges that as chair of the Fed, he was acting as the gold standard. Um, <laughs> so one way or the other, he seems to still be on that position. Um, and the, the, the final article, which I think might be the most interesting in terms of our, our thinking about capitalism and the recent crisis, is the assault on integrity, which argues that regulation is wrong because it undermines the ability of business men and women to compete on reputation. Um, and it's also wrong because it replaces the moral discipline of the market with fear, with force and fear. So uh, Greenspan argues it's in the self-interest of every businessman to have a good reputation. And that if you regulate, uh, people will stop trying to uh, develop and burnish a good reputation and will just do the bare minimum of what they have to do to stay legal. But again, it comes back to this, this, this sort of Randian sense that capitalism, there's a morality embedded in capitalism which is very profound and very important and that we, to tinker with it is to really uh, a do moral wrong. So as he concludes, um, quote, capitalism is based on self-interest and self-esteem. 
It holds integrity and trustworthiness as cardinal virtues and makes them pay off in the marketplace, thus demanding that men survive by means of virtues, not vices. It is this superlatively moral system that the welfare status proposed to improve upon by means of preventative law, snooping bureaucrats, and the chronic goad of fear. So here's an argument that capitalism sort of elevates the moral tone of those who participate in it. And that bringing government in makes people lazy, makes them focus on the short term, not the long term, and not really, uh, not really get maybe the moral benefit that competition in an unregulated market can bring. So, so these three pieces that I summarize here are obviously the product of a young man. And I think all of you would probably be troubled to hear a public talk on uh, things you write at this stage in your life, you know, 30 years hence. So, so uh, I do have to put a, a disclaimer on that. And Greenspan writes in his autobiography that, you know, he continues to appreciate Rand, but he moved away from her as he sort of understood that, you know, principles weren't everything that he had to uh, sort of live in the real world, as it were. But in this passage, Greenspan is not alone. And I think that brings us to the nexus of Rand's appeal, this this sort of metaphor I've been talking about her as a gateway or an opening. Um, and as a historian, I locate Rand's significance not in the relatively small number of people who buy into objectivism and stay there and consider themselves objectivists and take Rand as their guide to all action for the rest of their lives. Because that's, that's a small number of people, those who remain wedded to her philosophy. Um, what I find much more historically significant and meaningful is those who take something from Rand and blended with other approaches and topics. So those who are able to sort of break out of this objectivist ghetto, yet still bring some of its fundamental principles and ideas and concepts with them. Now, Greenspan started as a very devout follower of Rand, and he remained close to her through his ascent up the political ladder. I have a photograph in my book of his swearing-in ceremony uh, from President Ford, the Council of Economic Advisors, and it's um, President Ford, Alan Greenspan, Alan Greenspan's mother, Ayn Rand, and Ayn Rand's husband. You know, and this is the small group, the family group that he brought with him, I think it's 1976, um, it might be 74 then, so, so quite some time after he's had his first <coughs> encounter with her. Um, and so although, you know, uh, the, the more orthodox objectivists claim he could never be an objectivist because he took this position in government, because he took this managing uh, regulatory role, I think he's really emblematic of how Rand's influence has spread, that is taking some of it and going other places with it. And one thing I've been asked about a lot is this new willingness of those on the right to embrace Rand despite the problematic parts of her thought, particularly her atheism. Why is her atheism not such a problem? Now, I get this question all the time. I have a couple of different theories, but this, this willingness to embrace her despite the pieces that don't fit, I think suggests that this process uh, is ongoing of integrating Rand into our views on capitalism and markets, and I think it suggests that her influence may just be beginning. So um, I would be happy to take any further questions. Thank you for your attention. My recollection is that Ayn Rand had a uh, enjoyed a strong, successful men. How do you think she would look at, say, Dick Fold and Jim Cain? Dick Fold and Jim Cain. The head of uh, Bear Stearns, the head of Lehman Brothers. I mean, are these fallen heroes, or are these um, charlatans? You know, what's interesting is there's a few comments about you know the stock market in Atlas Shrugged, and it's always kind of contraposed to um, building a business over the long term. She really thinks about Businessmen in her world you have a lot of integrity, they plan for the long term. They're not concerned with the stock price, they're concerned with building fundamental value. They're all value investors in her world. To be a business person is to be a value investor. So um, I think that she would say, um, you know, with, with all of the people who are making the news for, for um, bad economic feeling, that maybe they're not representative of the best that businessmen can be. And what I think is another thing she's offering us in this moment is a really positive picture. Um, what we see in the news are you know, businessmen going to jail, capitalists going to jail, people ripping each other off with these flim flam schemes. You go to Atlas Shrugged, everybody's productive, they're strong, they have integrity, they're inventing new steel alloys and building railroads. So um, she was really focused on the sort of part of American industrialism. I don't know 
how she would view the financial sector. I think that sort of came along just as she was exiting the scene. I don't know how she would integrate it fully other than she always emphasized creation. Um, whether she would include new financial instruments as a, you know, as something creative that is, you know, expresses man's um, uh, uh, deepest accomplishment, I don't know. I don't think she would include, you know, financial instruments that that turn out to be so toxic in that in that claim because she really was focused on building, creating for the long term. I was just curious, given the uh, comments of selfishness in the system, how did she look at things like love, marriage? Did those exist or? Were they are totally transactional? What were they? Um, she had a whole theory of um, love and sex. Um, there's a sort of odd theory of man worship, uh, which is uh, you know women should worship men for their superior values, and that that seems to stem from some of her own personal things. In terms of how it fit into the system, um, there is a sense of transaction. Love is a recognition of your values, and you're trading values for values. But in the context of love, is where you can act in ways that look unselfish, but to Rand remain selfish because you are supporting your values. So if you value somebody, you may be sacrificing yourself on the surface to them, but you're not really because your actions to help them are, are part of your larger value system. She didn't bring in, for example, long term, that maybe in your long term interest, this relationship was useful. Um, you know, it was more that what you saw in the other person reflected your highest values. Yes. And, and, and love was a response to values in another person. So. She had a lot of trouble with the idea of like a one night stand. You know, that, that doesn't really fit in. Um, sexual attraction in her novel is always based on this sort of recognition of shared value. So it's either, you know, earth moving love or it's nothing at all. There's, there's not a lot of middle ground. Thank you. Hi. What was the um, biggest surprise that you came across in her private papers, the papers that hadn't been looked at by scholars before? Um, I think part of it was what I read just now, how very political um, the works were and how very deliberately she made them political. I thought when I first started, like, maybe I'm reading too much into this here. And then I got in the papers and was like, no, no, no. She saw herself, as she called it, being, she wanted to become the John Steinbeck of the right. You know, she wanted to become sort of identified as a literary and a political figure. And that that idea came so early. And also what I pointed out that the Wilkie Clubs were really the Nathaniel Brandon Institute, you know, 40 years before. So she had a way of thinking of something she wanted to do and just doing it. It's kind of uncanny that she had this really incredible follow through, um, which is, I kind of am still in awe of in a lot of ways. In the far back, yeah. Um, I understand that she wasn't, she didn't like being called a libertarian and she wasn't very fond of libertarians. And I always had a, a problem trying to understand where is it that her views um, are different from, at least in a political perspective, from, from the libertarian party or the libertarian ideals? So there's a lot of similarity. Libertarians take as their sort of founding axiom this idea that the initiation of force is immoral. Um, and libertarians loved Rand, and Rand hated libertarians. And she would just come out in the 70s and just call them scum, plagiarists, like the worst people, I mean, really vehement. She had two main objections. One was she thought they plagiarized her ideas and didn't give her credit. Um, now, in this, she was, <laughs> she was acknowledging what is, in fact, true, that libertarian is deeply inspired um, by her ideas. I mean, she's really the sort of founding in the mother of the movement. So, so that, she was accurate. But what bothered her even more, maybe, than they stole her ideas, was that they packaged them with the complete opposite. That is, a political theory that had nothing to say about morality, that was a sort of, if it feels good, do it, do what you want to do, just don't interfere with anybody else. And she thought you had to defend capitalism from the proper moral grounding, or you might as well not defend it at all. So libertarians missed this rational morality, um, this, this, this vision of human nature that she thought was her most important contribution. So it enraged her that they would take this, what she thought was a peripheral piece, and then you know, run off with it, and then not give her credit, but also abuse it. You know, just, she couldn't see eye to eye of them at all. Libertarians still, to this day, you know, consider Rand a very important part of their movement. Um, and there's, a, there's a, a thaw to some degree right now between objectivists and libertarians, but in general, historically, they've been you know, at each other's throats. Sure. Uh, sure, in your research, how do you think she would have dealt with the globalization that you know, really has transpired in the last 20 years? And can a, can a, a purely objectivist country in the world, in a, global, in a globalized economy, actually function and succeed? Uh, if everyone else isn't. Right, in terms of, 
I mean, there's many facets to globalization. I'm not sure what exactly she would pick out to respond to. I think she'd be very heartened by the, the turn towards capitalism in a whole host of countries that were uh, previously socialist. And she's got a large following in gr some growing economies, particularly India. Um, they really respond well to her. Um, I think she would see it probably as a good sign because she thought capitalism really would spread this moral system. It would spread um, freedom to other people. It would spread moral and just societies that were non-coercive. Um, I don't know how she would handle you know, a country like China that is you know, bringing in um, uh, economic freedom but not uh, social freedom. What did she say? Economic freedom and political freedom are corollary, something along those lines. She sounded very, very linked. So I think she would think we were moving ever further away from a stage of barbarism, which is how she characterized communism and collectivism, into a, a more rational, enlightened uh, future world. So I, I think it would, it would hearten her in many ways. One of our colleagues uh, uh, expressed his criticism of, of her by not understanding the concept of, of externalities. So mm -hmm. that would be you build a plant and it has pollution um, and therefore has you know, consequences that are negative for other people, but may not be contrary to self interest of the owner of that factory. So you must have heard this before, and she must have heard that. Did, did she have a response to that sort of criticism? or? Uh, you know, most of what I've seen is libertarians um, defending her or working from an objectivist right. position, and, and this especially came up in the early 70s with the rise of the environmental movement when pollution suddenly became an issue. And the, the, the libertarian position would be um, it should be taken care of through the courts so you shouldn't litigate, um, which has the obvious problem of closing the door after the horse is gone, right? How, you know, how do you clean up once, once the damage has been done? But she would say objective law um, and litigation would be the way to basically um, you know, build those costs in through the legal system. She really hated environmentalism. Um, she couldn't see it as a genuine movement at all. Um, she saw it in the frame of um, civilizational change and that man had conquered nature and this was his great achievement. She loved New York. You know, she, she didn't really like sunshine. She didn't like the outdoors. She loved New York because it was like man at his best, creating, you know, asphalt and steel. <laughs> what it's all about. And so when she saw environmentalism, she had no sympathy for the idea that you might be protecting um, the environment. She, she tended to see political movements. She tended to hear what they were saying and then bore down and say, okay, what are they really about? And she thought that environmentalism was really a, the new face of collectivism and they were trying to drag mankind back in time. Now what I think is interesting here is her experience living in Petrograd, living in a civilized, um, highly developed city that just deteriorated over the, she saw that happen. So for her it was very palpable that we could go backwards at any time and she feared that environmentalism was the sort of, you know, the toxin and we are heading back in time. Um, so she didn't wrestle with that issue explicitly. I think that some of the people following in her thought have wrestled with it and they've come upon you know, litigation as the, the solution. Sorry. Would you comment uh, on the relationship between Ayn Rand and Milton Friedman? Sure. Um, Milton Friedman called her, let me see if I can get the quote right, something like, uh, a, a very unpleasant woman who did a great deal of good. <laughs> <laughs> and he basically said, um, if you became a Randian, you were useless. If you just read her ideas, she was very useful for the movement uh, of which he considered himself part. But there's a number of really interesting similarities. So. Rand um, launched an attack on President Kennedy. She wanted to publish a book called The Fascist New Frontier, um, which Random House was terrified to publish. <laughs> and it ended, terminated the relationship between the publisher and, and Rand. But the first sentence of capitalism and freedom is you know, this attack upon Kennedy's ass, not what you can do for your country, your country can do for you. So I, I see a lot of similarities between them. I think Friedman occupies a different place in our culture because he had this technical background in economics. He had a university position. Um, and he was able to, you know, bridge his economic ideas with, with other, he was less, he was sort of less of a bomb thrower than Rand. Um, so he appreciated her. She, uh, the, the, the most, the closest she came to him was an early pamphlet he wrote, his, one of his first published works called Roofs or Ceilings. He wrote with George Stigler and it was produced by, was distributed by uh, Foundation for Economic Education, one of these early libertarian organizations. And Rand, read this pamphlet and just flipped out, thought it was this terrible communistic thing, and this led to a schism between her and someone she'd previously been close to over the issue of the pamphlet. So that's Rand on Friedman, he's a communist, you know? <laughs> <laughs>
why do you consider Ayn Rand a bomb thrower? Is there anything that she said that um, she couldn't back up? Or, uh, or, or are you characterizing uh, how others thought of her? You know, I think by that term I meant more she enjoyed being provocative. Um, like, for instance, this idea of selfishness, the virtue of selfishness. So Nathaniel Brandon, who was you know, the person she listened to the most, who was the most influential, he tried and tried and tried. Don't use that word selfishness. It just gets people's hackles up, and sh they shut down, and they don't really hear what you have to say because you're using this incendiary word. And she was sort of like, so what? They should read me more carefully. You know, so she didn't mind um, being a revolutionary. She didn't mind, she called herself a radical for capitalism. She didn't mind if she was seen as an immoralist. Um, she was willing to, to be out there on her own and take a very radical stance. So that's what I mean. She sort of she liked to stir the pot and she, she liked to create a fuss and that was that's so part of her persona. If I can just follow up, she explained in the uh, introduction what she meant by that and why she was using that word. Right, and but the, 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 what her what her what uh, you know Brandon and others were trying to say is you can explain all you want, but you need to think about how these are received immediately by people who hear about you, by people who don't read carefully. She was never interested in that. She was interested in speaking to the very educated, very careful reader. Um, and that's why all these kind of stereotypes of her really were, were able to get up and grow because she, was, she wasn't she was thinking about PR, you know, which is part of who she was. Yeah, I, I can back that up a little bit. That's one of the people you refer to as the few who remain wedded. Uh, <laughs> when, the, uh, when the moral majority movement started, she seriously considered starting a counter movement to be named the immoral minority. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she was comfortable being there, you know, yeah. absolutely. So I think that's just part of her persona um, and, you know, part of her power, but also maybe part of her weakness because it causes a lot of people, even today, to just shut down. You say Ayn Rand and they shut down immediately. Um, and that's one thing I'm trying to do in the book, say, don't shut down before you figure out what's going on in there. If once you figure out, then you want to shut down, that's fine, but um, hear what she had to say, because a lot of other people heard what she had to say, and it's important um, for understanding you know, where we all are today, so. Sure. You mentioned her atheism, but also her respect for sacrifice for a higher principle, which sounds almost spiritual to me. Uh, where exactly did she draw the line? Um, I mean, that's a great question, and she actually, in the, in the 25th anniversary edition of The Fountainhead, talks about, um, she acknowledges the sort of religious energy in The Fountainhead, which is very much a part of her book, and is one reason for the sort of play on words in my title, Goddess of the Market. Um, and she said she was trying to bring back these emotions like exaltation, worship, um, commitment to a higher ideal that she thought religion had stolen, basically. They all become linked to religion, and she wanted to bring them back to humanity, to the glorification of man for who he was without any reference to supernaturalism or belief system. So, um, and, and she was sort of taking a page from Nietzsche in that, again, she acknowledges that you know, Nietzsche had this really uh, sort of glorification of humanity, um, and she wanted to, to have that same impact in her work. She absolutely wanted to do that. Um, she was still livid when people would write to her and say, I think you're really Christian. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. You know, but there is this kind of, um, there's, a, there's some spiritualism to her work, absolutely, and that's why she hits people so deeply, and I think why her work is you know, sustained to this very day. So. We have time for maybe one more question. One more question. <laughs> Who will it be? All right. Um, uh, objectivism is uh, normally seen as a religion of the rock stars. So, I mean, how do you, uh, how, how does the common man or the not so talented people, how, I mean, how do you, how, how's Ayn Rand's theory in, uh, help that guy? Yeah, so a lot of literary critics thought her characters are so unrealistic and they're cardboard and terrible. And what I found in these fan letters is people said, I felt like I knew Dagny, I felt like I knew Howard. Or they'd say, it really a caused me to ask myself, am I a Peter Keating? You know, led to this kind of self-examination. You know, am I a second-hander? Um, so I think a lot of readers recognized these were idealized types or characters, and that was actually part of their appeal. Um, maybe the younger readers of her, you know, thought they could become a Superman, but I think a lot of them, uh, whether they didn't have to necessarily develop an exalted sense of self to be inspired by the characters and to look at them as something, um, you know, a model of behavior or a model of morality or a model of how to be in the world. So. Um, you know, and, and Rand has been more popular among a popular audience than she's been among elites. 
Um, so it, it's, you know, there, there is some elitism in her philosophy. There's also um, a, a real emphasis on everybody can be part of this world. She emphasizes independence. That becomes the standard. So you can be kind of mediocre, but as long as you're independently mediocre, you're not mediocre in anybody else's terms, that's okay. And she's very careful. Um, the opening of Atlas Shrugged has, um, I think it's Dagny walking in the, the streets of this crumbling New York, and she sees a bus turning a corner, expertly steered, and she kind of ah, breathes a sigh of relief that there's competence in something as, you know, uh, driving a bus, which you wouldn't think of as a very exalted profession. So I think that's part of the, the message that whatever you're doing, do it well, be proud of it. Um, you don't have to be John Galt as long as you, you know, drive that bus with all the skill and power you have. You know, so um, I think that's part of why she's she's accessible um, more than you might think from a first book. Thank you.